I'd like you to turn in your Bibles with me to the book of James. The book of James, chapter 1. Turn in your Bibles or turn in your Bible app, whatever you have available there with you. Again, if you don't have a Bible, you can download one onto your smartphone real easily. It's uh, the Bible app. Um, what's that called, Carmen? The U version. The U version. I think most of you have that already, so uh, feel free to grab that, download it, and it's a fantastic, fantastic tool uh, to have on your phone there. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. If you're there, say amen. It says in God's word, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops what? Perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be what? So that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your word here in this book of James, and I pray you continue to give us understanding, Lord, that you touch my lips to be able to speak to your people today, God, that you touch my mind, Lord, to be able to think and think clearly, God, even though there's weariness here, God, that you give me the, the strength, the joy of the Lord is my strength today, God, I thank you, Lord, for these good people, that you'd bless each and every one, God, that you touch our ears to hear, God, that we'd not just be listeners of the word, but also doers of the word. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity. Lord, I pray you would take my stutter and my stammer to be able to speak clearly to your people. In Jesus' name. And everybody said again, amen. Amen. Some of you kind of wonder what this is, kind of peeking out up over the pulpit. And I got to tell you, it's a sea turtle. <laughs> Part of what I'm going to be talking about this morning is a little bit of our vacation experience that we had down there in Texas uh, two weeks ago, we got back from Texas, and we went down to, uh, um, some, what's the town? Corpus Christi. I always want to say Sangre de Cristo. I know it's Spanish. But Corpus Christi, and uh, we went down and, and stayed in a little condo on uh, the San Padre Island, Padre Island, and that was a good time. And one of the things we had the opportunity to do there was, was watch some uh, sea turtles. And so as we continued to engage in that, you understand that for me, watching sea turtles is not really a masculine thing. That's not something as a man I want to go and admit, okay, to too many people. But we had a good time kind of doing that. And uh, you know you're going to get up and go to the beach. You're going to have a lot of women and kids kind of walking around just oogling and gagaing about, oh, that's so cute. You know how their voice changes when they see something cute, you know. Like men's voice changes when we watch uh, football or racing or some kind of wrestling show. You know, Tim the Toolman Taylor, we, our voice changes too, but women's voice changes whenever they see something cute. All right? And so, you know, it's so cute. It's so adorable. Those are the kind of words that we hear. Um, you know, it's kind of like when, when men, when your wife makes you try on shirts when you go to the store. That's why I don't go to the store very often because she makes me try on clothes. I'd rather she bring them home, me try them on at home, and then take them back. It's just... Uh, much less suffering for me. But sometimes you go to the store and you get a little buttonholed into it anyways and, and, and you put on a new shirt and come out and you're just kind of like standing there and you just kind of let yourself be on display. And what is it your wife says? That's such a cute shirt on you. Okay. At worst, ladies, our men's shirts are handsome. At worst. But a men's shirt is never supposed to be cute. Okay, if, if she says it looks cute on me, it's automatically going back on the hanger. I'm not going to wear it. All right. So again, we're talking about sea turtles here, and this is my daughter's little uh, sea turtle she bought at the store, and it's called a, Kemp Ridley is the, is the type or the species of the turtle, and so she called, called this little thing Kemp, uh, I think it's his name, I'm not sure, but she teases me about this being my grandchild. And I'm thinking, honey, you're way too young to be talking about grandkids. And uh, so she's 10 years old, and she loves stuffed animals. Uh, so if I'm talking about sea turtles being cute and all that kind of stuff, I might as well talk about unicorns. I just, uh, I just don't like doing it very often. But uh, so we get up there in, in Corpus Christi, and it's the night before, and they, they have these uh, uh, sea turtle hatchlings that are all, they, they come out of the, the egg, they manage to find the eggs. They bring them to an incubator there at the Forest Service uh, place there. Um, and then they wait for them to hatch. 
And then once they've determined that most of them are hatched and are ready to be launched into the sea, then they'll put it on their website. And it may be just a few hours notice because once they, once they start coming out of the, the eggs, they only have a few hours and they need to be released, right? And so we're watching here, and this is kind of the neat thing. We know we're getting to the end of the season. It's uh, getting into August now, and so there's not too many of them left. And so he comes up. Carmen says that night, says, honey, would you like to go with us to watch the sea turtle hatchlings? She says, it's going to be adorable. It's going to be awesome. You know, it's so rare that it happens. And uh, uh, by the way, we'll have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. And so I'm just thinking all these things, and I'm just like, she's asking me all this. You want to get up with us at 5 o'clock in the morning? So the first thing I say is, sure, you know. (laughs) I'm on vacation. Five o'clock in the morning, it doesn't sound too appealing. I mean, it's still dark outside. We get up and we go and we watch these little turtles on the beach. And so this morning is going to be kind of a parable type of a message illustrated with these sea turtles as we walk through some of this understanding of Scripture. And Jesus used parables a lot of times. Throughout the, the New Testament there, the, the Gospels, uh, Jesus used parables. He, he equated life, real life, with kingdom principles. And so we'll be doing that a little bit this morning. But the first point I want to make this morning is that we will endure trials of many kinds. James chapter 1 verse 2 tells us that we will have trials of many kinds. And when we understand trials of many kinds, we understand that life is hard. Life is hard. Like getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning, for me, that's hard on vacation. We had, um, uh, Carmen went out and we, we go on vacation and she buys a whole slew of groceries, awesome groceries, because at vacation, nobody's counting calories, right? And so we enjoy vacation. She goes out and gets all the good food, all the good stuff, and gets tons of ice cream. She had a box of ice cream sandwiches there. There was four in a box. And so after we got back from being a, having a day in Corpus Christi, uh, the kids and her, her the, the three of them, they go down to the little pool that the condo has, right? And so I get to have a chance to sit up in the room by myself and watch some television, and the first thing I do is I go raid the fridge. I open up the freezer door, and lo and behold, there's that box of ice cream sandwiches. So I eat one. I sit down and watch a little bit of television. I said, that was such a blessing from the Lord. I love that. That was wonderful. And I said, surely God wants more blessing in my life. Come bless me, Lord. So I go and I get a second ice cream sandwich and I sit down and I eat the whole thing. And I say, God is good. And there's still two more left. And so I go and I get a third ice cream sandwich and I eat it and I swallow it down. And then I go and I think that was wonderful. And I go to that fourth ice cream sandwich and conviction comes upon me. And I said, I better not eat that. The whole time the kids are swimming in the pool, don't know anything's going on. So they come back up to the, to the condo, and they're, they're dripping wet, and they're having a good time. What is it they do? The first thing they do, they go raid the fridge, and they open up the freezer, and here's this box, and they shake the box, and one comes out. And they said, Dad, what happened? I said, I don't, I don't know, kids. That's something you're going to have to talk to your mom about. So sometimes life is hard, Right? Life can be hard sometimes when you're restraining yourself from having to eat that extra ice cream sandwich. And sometimes there's, there's certain expectations that we have in life because life can sometimes be hard. And what, does, what, what, what is it that makes life hard? It's when those expectations that we have about life are not met. And when, we, when those expectations of life are not met, we what? We struggle. Some of us are struggling today with something in our life because what we expected out of life is not working out the way we had hoped. Isn't that right? Sometimes we have kids that we raise up in church. We have grandkids that we raise up in church. But when they become older, they fall away from God. They fall away from church. They fall away from Christ. That's not what we expected. And we have to deal with those trials. We understand that life is hard. And we become discouraged when our kids walk away from God. Others of us are perhaps discouraged a little bit when we invest heavily in your business. And it seems like now for 10, 20, 30 years that you've only been just financially treading water You thought by this time in your life you had been doing much better by now. It seems like you're just barely breaking even. You're not getting ahead in life like you thought you would at this time. Others of us are planning a wonderful retirement and and hoping to enjoy the retirement years with with traveling and, and seeing the countryside. But instead your health has failed and it looks like you'll be staying home and using your savings instead to pay medical bills. Because life and the expectations of life didn't pan out like what we had thought. Friends, life is hard and life is also not fair. A lot of our kids are belly aching right now that life's not fair because they have to go to school in the morning. I know my kids are belly aching about the Montrose and Olathe kids. They don't have to start school for another week. 
That's not fair. We hear that in our homes right now, don't we? But life is certainly not fair. We observe some of these young hotshots, these millennials and some of these iGen people that are writing computer code and computer programs and, and they're making video games for a living and seemingly becoming multimillionaires overnight. Meanwhile, the teachers and the policemen, the nurses, the farmers, many of them just try to work hard just to try to make ends meet at the end of each month. It's not fair, is it? Life is not fair when we observe children being struck with cancer and we watch their struggle and sometimes their struggle ends in death, doesn't it? It's not fair. And while on the flip side we observe others that seemingly can ruin their life with alcoholism or drug abuse and they live to be a long, old, good old age. We don't understand these things. Life, friends, is not fair. The Bible says that we will endure trials of many kinds. The Bible says we need to do this. We need to go through this for various reasons. Secondly, this morning, talking about our struggle, is that struggle produces maturity. The Bible says this in James chapter 2, verse 4, that our struggle produces maturity and completion. Friends, we have to struggle. We have to. You can't get out of struggle. You must struggle. Some of these kids are struggling with going back to school tomorrow. But we have to go to school. These kids have to get an education. If they don't get their, their education at school, at the elementary level, at the secondary level, at the high school level, if they don't get that education, then their life is going to be even more of a struggle. It's struggle now or struggle later, but you're going to struggle. We have to struggle in life as well as, as, well as our spiritual walk. Just like when we talk about these little sea turtles, as I get back to a little bit of the parable of the sea turtle, these little sea turtles have to struggle. Good little Kimpy. <laughs> they have to struggle, otherwise they will not survive if they don't struggle. They will not survive, they won't make it in this life unless they struggle. They will become hopelessly lost in the ocean if they don't struggle. Once the turtles have hatched out of their eggs, they have to be semi-immediately launched into the ocean, and sometimes they do their releasings at, uh, at night, and sometimes very early in the morning when the sun is just coming up, but it has to be within a few hours, reasonably, of when they hatch. And so a lot of times it's just a last-minute notification of when they, when they allow the public to know, and sometimes they have to cancel a launch, and sometimes they go through with it. But they have a God-given energy. God created these little animals, these little guys, with a God-given energy that lasts only three days. Okay, as soon as they break through the egg, they, they may start tapping into that energy called the frenzy. That's what, the, that's what these Forest Service people call it, the frenzy. And they have three days of frenzy energy. It's some of the leftover proteins of the egg that they had come out of, some of the leftover uh, environs that they're still eating off of in their body. And so they have three days to try to dig out of the sand and get to the top, get to the surface of the sand, because they're about anywhere from a few inches down to six, eight inches down. They have to dig up out of the sand, and then they have to, to find which way the ocean is, and they have to crawl down a long beach, deal with the ocean waves, swim through the water, and then find a hiding place where they can hide away from all of their natural predators within three days. That if they have not gotten into the ocean and gotten secured in the ocean within three days, then they're, they're dead. They're going to die. They have to learn to eat by the end of that third day. They have to teach themselves to eat. There's not some mama turtle that's going to teach them how to. It is just a God-given sense and ability and discernment of what to eat and how to eat. If they have not learned how to eat within three days, they die. And so we continue to understand some of these concepts that life is hard, that life is not fair. They have to drag themselves through this place. But the lesson we learn from that little passage is that believers need to learn to feed themselves with God's word. If you are not feeding yourselves God's word, then you will spiritually die. You're going to dry up. If, if the word of God, all you're doing with the word of God is, is once on Sundays, then you are spiritually anemic and you're going to be starving. And you're going to open up yourself to the natural predators of your spirit man. The spiritual predators that are wanting to assail you. There's, there's life, there's the things of this world, and there's the portions of the demonic that wants to seek and destroy and to kill you off. Okay? And so if you're not eating, like this little guy, he's eating, he has to eat every day. If you're not eating of the Word of God every single day, you will not make it. 
These little turtles must struggle. They have to struggle. It's required. They have to struggle on the beach. And, and a lot of people would begin to wonder and, and, and question, why don't we as, as, as forest rangers, why don't we take them from the box when they're hatched out of it? Why don't we just take them straight to the ocean? And why don't we just help them get the little flippers going? And why can't we just put them in the water and help them along? Isn't that, after all, the humane thing to do? Because it's in our hearts, right, to help these guys out to help them get through life. We want to give them the best chances of survival, right? They're, they're an endangered, the, 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 the Wikipedia says that they are critically endangered species. So wouldn't it be in our best interest to give them as much help as possible? And isn't it cruel to, to make them struggle and strive on the beach for such a long time? Friends, the struggle is necessary for these little guys. Sometimes we would step back and say, it's not fair. Why must we, why must we watch their struggle. Well, friends, science has begun to teach uh, the different forest rangers about the, uh, the Kemp Ridley turtle. I guess all sea turtles in general, they must have the struggle. If they don't have the struggle on the beach, then they will be lost. If the, if the rangers just put them in the water and let them go, they will be lost forever, and the high, high percentage of them are, are killed off if they don't have the struggle on the beach. Friends, there's something in that struggle of that turtle, that 30 to 40 minutes of just using their front flippers, of, of waddling through that, that sand and, and fighting and fighting. It's just these little tiny guys just continuing to, to try to dig their flippers in. almost lost my gum there. <laughs> the 30 to 40 minute struggle on the beach will bring them home, friends. Do you understand that? The struggle brings them home. There's something that happens in the natural that allows that turtle to have the, the beach imprinted on their mind. If the rangers put them in the water and let them go, they'll never return home. They never come back to the beach. But if those turtles struggle down the beach for that 30 minutes, 40 minutes, they come back after a year, and they lay their eggs on the beach when they mature. That's a pretty incredible thing. When I'm watching this, and I'm kind of like here, what, I'm watching little baby sea turtles. It's not a manly thing to do. All these girls and kids crowding around. But the Lord's continued to showing me these parallels of our walk in the faith, of our spiritual journey with, this, with all that's going on here. We have to struggle, otherwise we don't make it home. The Bible says that if you raise up a child the way he should go, then when he is older, he will not depart from it. Friends, there is something in the struggle. When you struggle every Sunday morning to get your kids ready for church, and they're belly aching, and they're whining, and they have something break, and they got their zippers on backwards, or something's going on, that's the struggle. But the struggle is worth it, getting them to church fighting them day in and day out, getting them a godly education, giving them a, a godly uh, grounding here in God's house. The struggle is real and the struggle is worth it, friends. Yes, they may turn their back on God when they enter college, but friends, that seed is always there. Your lifestyle is always there. They cannot run from God. They can't get away from him. He will always be there. And someday, maybe when they start having kids, we see a lot of the 30-somethings the come back to God. We see a lot of the 30-somethings come back to church because they're now having kids. And they want their kids to have a godly, moral-based education in, in God's house. You can't get rid of it. Friends, the struggle is okay. You're struggling now, but there will come a day when it will all be worth it. Friends, if they don't have the struggle, if you just let your kids stay at home when they're, when they're raising up, friends, they won't know their way back home. They'll be lost. They'll be lost forever. They've got to have God's word in their heart. They have to have God's word in their life. Give them the opportunity to be able to find their way back. Give them Jesus, friends. What happens if this entire generation of sea turtles, what if, what if all these sea turtles, there was about uh, 40 of them they left out, what if we put all 40 of them in the water, let them go, none of them would come back. That entire generation would be lost because everybody decided to make it easy on them. And that's the generation, and that's the culture in which we live today, is let's make it easy on them. Let's make it easy on this younger generation. Let's make it easy on them. Let's help them out as much as we possibly can. Let's not let them struggle. But friends, if they don't know the struggle, they don't understand the struggle, they'll never come home. We've made it too easy on them for far too long. We've continued to make life easy on them. We had a, we had a high standard of morality and ethics but let's continue to lower those standards of morality and ethics. Let's go ahead and tell them that it's okay to, to, to live with your boyfriend. It's okay to live with your girlfriend. It's okay to do that. Let's lower that. Friends, let's continue to make it easier. Let's continue to redefine and erode morality. Let's make it easier on them. Friends, when we continue to have and endorse immorality in America, we write it off as tolerance. 
our little ones are losing their way home. They won't know the beach to get back to because the beach has become so eroded, they won't know how to get back. Friends, the life lesson of that is, is that life struggles remind us where we started and, and it reminds us where we came from. The struggle is real, but the Bible says we must struggle. We're going to go through seasons of struggle. After the first 30 minutes of struggling hard on that sand, the, the turtles continue to push that sand back and then they'd stop and they'd pause. It seemed like, like, they're, like they're resting, like they're so tired and they're so weary, but they finally get close to the waves and their first encounter, their first taste of the ocean is not pleasant. It's vicious. You can imagine these little guys only about two or three inches long in that little wave, even though it's small by our standards, to them it's a wall of water and it hits them straight in the face and it blows them back and they roll back three feet, four feet back. Some of them get knocked on their back. So they flip back over and they keep goggling forward. They keep struggling forward. They keep moving onward towards the waves. They get knocked back two times. They get knocked back three times. It's like all of that, that two or three feet was so valued to the, valuable to them. They're so tired and they're exhausted but they keep going. They keep going. The first taste of the ocean is bitter, but they don't give up. They've worked so hard to take that ground, that three or four feet, and it seems like it just keeps getting taken back away from them. That, that three or four feet, that three or four precious feet is yanked from their flippers, but they keep going. And how do we as Christians talk about these things? We're going to get knocked down. Sometimes we're, we're going through our struggles and it seems like we're doing all we can and we're tired and we're weary. And it just when it seems like the finish line is right ahead of us, the finish line comes and slaps us in the face. It knocks us back. We have gained that three or four feet in our spiritual walk, our spiritual journey with God. And all of a sudden, sin comes and slaps us right in the face. It knocks us back. It may knock us back on our back. We have to work hard and strive to get back up on our, on our, our belly, on our flippers. We have to get back up. Because if we lay there, we die. If we allow sin to overwhelm us and conquer us, then we die. We have to allow the power of the Holy Spirit to say, keep on going. Get back up. Keep on striving. I'm here with you. Don't give up. Those little guys, you know, all 40 of them, they made it. All 40 of them made it to the water. All of them got knocked back, too, at some point or another. They all got knocked back by different waves. Because they didn't release them all at once. They released them in a staggered set. So there were some that were way ahead and some that were way behind. So it was different things in their life that knocked them back. There's going to be different things in your spiritual journey that's going to knock you back. What knocks your neighbor back is not going to be what knocks you back. Friends, but sin is going to, it's going to, it's going to mess us up sometimes. It's going to set us back, but we don't give up. The Bible says that, that Jesus is the lifter of our head. That means that our head is down. When, we're, when our head is down in defeat, Jesus is the lifter of our head. The Bible also says that, that a bruised reed, he will not break. He won't finish you off. A bruised reed, it's bent over, it's, it's tired, it's, it's kind of half broken, but he is the binder of the broken heart. And he, he wraps us up and he gives us strength to continue to go into it again and deal with it. I've said many times that when we deal with life, the Christian walk is, is not about falling down, but it's about getting back up one more time than you fall down. Getting back up one more time than what you fall down. That's the Christian life. Get back up. One more time than what you fall down. The struggle is real, friends. We understand that. We acknowledge that. The lesson of that is that life struggles are indeed bitter. And we will sometimes lose ground. But we will make it. We will make it. There's also there on that beach that day, there was a struggle with distraction. These little turtles were released oftentimes at, at sunrise. And the sun is coming up there on, on the Padre Island they're heading straight into the surf, and they're looking at the sun, too. They're looking right at, the, at, right at the sunrise, and they struggle for that 30 minutes towards the rising sun. But the park rangers have already warned us there on the, on the Internet, on the website, and they've also warned us ahead of time when we're up on the deck, and they say, as you go down there, be careful. If you're wearing a white T-shirt, you need to stand behind everybody else. You need to stand in the back. And if you have a camera flash, if you have, if you have a camera, it's okay to take pictures, but turn the flash off. Why? Because there was distractions to the little guys. They said, if you have a white T-shirt on and that sun comes up and it, and it kind of makes your shirt really bright to the turtles, those turtles will end up going towards you. They said those, those turtles will start moving around and they see this white shirt and they're distracted and they think that you are the sun. 
You see the parallel in that, don't you? The, the spiritual parallel. Friends, there's going to be distractions in this world that's going to try to emulate the light of the sun, but it's fake. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and there's going to be things in this world that's going to try to distract us. There's going to be flashes of light. There's going to be white T-shirts out there that's going to try to distract us. Different things are going to try to pull you away from your goal. And friends, if you end up getting distracted by the things of this world, then you will die. You will die. Friends, you have to continue to keep your eyes on the Son, the Son of God, the Son of God. Friends, that lesson is this, is the world is full of cheap imitations and cheap substitutes that try to lure us off course in our faith. Friends, the only way to tell the difference between a, a t-shirt and a flash of a camera, friends, is the sun. What's the difference between those three? It's only one of them gives the warmth. Only one of those items, only one of those three, the sun, the t-shirt, and the camera, only one provides warmth. So even when you can't tell what the imitation, which one is real, understand the warmth. You may have to close your eyes. You may have to close your eyes and sense where is the warmth coming from because there's going to come times when you won't be able to, to discern. And you're just going to have to sense, say, Lord, where's the warmth of the Holy Spirit? Where's the warmth of the Son? Everything else is fake, a cheap imitation, but the warmth and the peace of Almighty God cannot be emulated. It cannot be copied. Friend, where does the, where does the warmth come from? The warmth comes from Christ alone. You can either look at the surf or you can look at the sun, friends. There's distractions everywhere. Look to the sun. Third and finally this morning is that you don't struggle alone. You're going to go through some struggles in your life, but you don't struggle alone. You will feel alone, but you won't struggle alone. Even when you don't see anybody else around, you are not alone. When we stood there on that beach there at San, San Padre Island, we understood a lot of different concepts. That were, God, God continued to show me these things. That there was a crowd. There was a crowd there that was cheering those little turtles on. There were several hundreds of people gathered around this little parameter. They, they put cones up there, and they put this uh, little marking tape across. You couldn't cross the boundaries. Hundreds of people. The website says sometimes thousands of people will show up to these turtle launchings. There was a great crowd that was there that was cheering those turtles on. Could we as bystanders and as watchers, could we help these little guys? No. We couldn't help them. But we were cheering them on as best we could. Kind of feel a little weird. Here's this guy going, come on, little turtle, go. You know. <laughs> Takes 40 minutes. By the time 40 minutes are done, you're like, come on already, please, get in the water. You know? <clears throat> Takes forever. But friends, a crowd is cheering you on. Everyone that was there that day on that beach on San Padre Island, Everyone was there for one reason, that was to watch these little guys succeed. Everyone was there to watch them succeed. Despite their struggles, they were struggling by themselves on that beach. And sometimes we as believers, we're going to struggle with things in our life like rebellion. We're going to struggle with, with depression. We're going to struggle with our finances. We may struggle with ungodly co-workers, maybe even godly co-workers. We're going to have some struggles that are there. And as we're struggling along, we think that nobody is there helping us out. But there is a crowd that is there cheering us on. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says this, therefore since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Friends, there is a cloud of witnesses in eternity that have already made it that is cheering you on. There is godly moms and dads and, and grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles. There may be even some sons and daughters that are there waiting on you and saying, Come on, you can do it. You can make it. The struggle is real, but we are cheering you on. Hallelujah. You do not struggle alone because, secondly, God is supervising your struggle. God is supervising your struggle. And as we were there on that beach, we watched this, this older, wizened park ranger all of the other rangers treated her with deference. They really respected her, and she, she gave the orders. Everywhere anybody went, she was giving the directions. This lady, this older lady had long blonde hair, and she knew each one of those turtles since they had hatched just a few hours earlier, and with gloved hands, she would gently pick up these, these turtles individually, and she placed them gently on the beach, and then she would point them in the right direction. She pointed them in the right direction and would let them go. God doesn't point us in the wrong direction, friends. 
He gave us his direction and he gave us his word. He points us in the right direction when he gave us his word. He points them in the right direction and encourages them gently. Now your race begins. Points them towards the surf. Points them towards the sun. And this older lady, this older park ranger, this PhD of something, she watched with pride and even a sense of sadness as they began their struggle on the beach. And you know what else I noticed? Is that she never said a word. You could just tell that she was proud of these little guys, but she never spoke a word. And sometimes we think that our struggle, we're all here by ourselves, our struggle is, is alone. And sometimes we say, God, where are you at? I, I can't hear your voice. I, I might be able to feel your presence, God, but I can't, I'm not hearing you. That lady never said a word to these little guys. She just pointed them in the right direction. She pointed them toward the surf into the sun and said, go on, you got this. But she never spoke to these little ones. And sometimes we're going to go through dry times in our life when we're seemingly, seemingly struck on a dry beach and it seems like a wilderness and nothing else is around. And we're struggling to hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit. But just because you're not hearing him at that time doesn't mean he's not there. He is superintending your struggle. He's watching over you. He is directing your paths. The struggle is real. We must go through this struggle. And God is watching it. God is watching us. He is, he is superintending our struggle. It's in everyone's heart to help these little guys, including hers. But she knew that the struggle had to happen. God's been watching over you just the same, friend. He has pointed you in the right direction. He has pointed you towards the Son, Jesus Christ. And he is cheering you on in your struggle, even though you may not hear his voice during the times of your struggle. A lot of times we may be mad at God for his seeming, seemingly lack of care. We perceive him, on our opinion, that he is ignoring our plight. Friends, God knows that you're mad at him. He knows that you're struggling through the, the beach, the dry beach of life. God knows you're angry with them. He understands it, but he's still cheering you onward. He's still superintending and supervising your struggle. He knows you're ticked, but he won't intervene. He won't intervene in your struggle because you have to go through this in order to get home. The third the third entity that is helping, that is, that is watching this, that is not allowing you to struggle alone, the third entity that is watching over our plight is, is that godly people are assisting in your struggle. Godly people are there assisting in your struggle. And as we watched there on that beach, there were, there were perhaps a half dozen lower-ranking rangers there that day, and they stood guard. They stood guard walking around those turtles. They didn't stand on guard from the humans, but they stood in guard from what? The seagulls. The seagulls were flying around, and anytime there's a large crowd of people on the beach, the seagulls know one thing, and there's food in that bunch somewhere. Seagulls are a natural predator to those little guys, these little, these little tiny turtles, about two inches long, three inches long. The seagulls would like to swoop in, but there was about half a dozen rangers, and they had long poles with little flags on the end of them, little streamers. Anytime the ghouls would get close, they'd, they'd wave those things, and those ghouls would become frightened by the, the movement, and they would fly away. And sometimes there are godly people that are placed in your life, you don't even realize it, and they're waving at those goals of your spirit. They're the, the goals that are wanting to consume your spirit, the goals that are wanting to, to, to try to snatch you up. And there are godly people that are, that are waving those poles, but they may instead be waving their hands in worship. They may be waving their hands in prayer time. When they're down on their knees and the Holy Spirit continues to, to place you, your name, on their mind, on their heart as they're praying, and they're crying out to God for, for Johnny, for Susie, for Sally. They're crying out to God, God, please, please help Sally get through this day. I know she's going through a struggle in her life. And that grandma or grandpa, that praying mom and that praying dad is waving those goals off. And yet in our struggle, we don't even know it. We don't even realize it, that they're there. All we can see is a face full of sand. We don't realize that there are godly people that are lifting you up in prayer. There may be somebody that's stepping forward with godly counsel. Maybe you're a young believer in Christ, and maybe there, there's a, a huge pitfall that you're about to step into, and they try to, to gently warn you about such things. 
They're trying to wave off the goals. They're trying to let your, let your struggle for Christ be real. They're trying to let your struggle for Christ be not in vain. They're trying to allow you to be successful. They're waving off the goals, the demonic goals that are trying to destroy your walk with Christ. Friends, godly people watch over you during your times of struggle. We don't even see it. Godly counsel may come to you. Then you see it, you realize it, and then they, they may help you to open your eyes to the fact that there's pitfalls and dangers ahead. My wife sometimes warns me and gives me warnings. A lot of times it's about other people. They say, we've got to be careful with this person. We've got to be careful with, with that lady. That lady there, she has a spirit on her, Jezebel, you know. We've got to keep careful of her. Steer clear. If you're going to talk to that lady, you make sure I'm standing there with you. Because women have that sixth sense, right? You listen to your ladies, men. You may not see it. You may not see it. You may not understand it. But if your wife is picking up on something, okay, listen to her. The godly counsel allows us to avoid those pitfalls. Friends, that fourth entity that watches over your struggle is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is protecting your struggle. That day that we were on the beach, there was also there was the rangers, half dozen rangers, and there was also about eight volunteers. These eight volunteers, they, they were also holding this pole, but instead of, of, of flags on them individually, they had these four poles were attached to a net-like canopy. And there was two canopies. So you had four volunteers on each canopy, right? Each one holding a corner. And it was a net-like canopy that also allowed the, the goals not to penetrate down. But there was two of them because they had, she had released them over the course of a few minutes, one at a time, so that they were spread out over a large area in that beach. So there was two groups that continued to slowly edge and walk with those turtles. Just a couple of inches every couple of minutes. And they would carry that canopy there, covering up those, those crazy little guys protecting them also from the goals. The flag guys were out there, in, they were in the ocean. They were up to their knees in, in the surf and the, and the waves. But these people were on land, the volunteers. They weren't rangers, but they were, they were standing there holding up that canopy. And to me, that, I got the sense that that was the Holy Spirit because the Bible says that his banner over us is love. His banner of love, as defined in the Bible, the, the Bible defines God's love in a little bit of a military sense. There were military divisions. And so when it's talking about God's love, it's talking about in military conditions of, of protection, of a shield, of, a, of armor. God's love protects us from those demonic goals out there that are trying to snatch us up, trying to snatch us away from the love of God. But his, his love there, his banner over us is love. That canopy was right over the top of those turtles. And you know what? The turtles never even noticed. The turtles never even said thank you. <laughs> Friends, you may not see all that's going on in the spiritual realm around you, but the Holy Spirit is real. He is covering you with his love. He's allowing godly people to try to help protect you also. Friends, you're going through times of struggle. And yeah, your face may be full of sand. But God is watching out over you. Your struggles are real. But God is just as real and he is superintending your struggles and he won't deliver you. He can't deliver you from every struggle. Sometimes your prayers go unanswered and thank God for that because the Bible says that our struggles produce what? Perseverance and maturity and completion. If we don't go through all the life struggles, that means we're going to be immature and not complete. And that's why the American church today is full of immature people. Because they've been delivered out of a lot of struggles. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to do His work in our lives. 